All right, guys, we're going to get started. Um, so I think, first of all, we want to um, sort of reintroduce our newest faculty member. Um, Annie Kual has returned to be a faculty member in pediatric ophthalmology. Annie, would you stand up? She did a residency here. This is her first grand rounds back. <laughs> Welcome back to Annie. Um, and then uh, today we're going to have um, our presentation by uh, Zachary Jost, one of our um, stellar first year residents. Um, something that you might not know about Zach is that he is a car aficionado. Is, um, he has, uh, is, has a real interest in antique cars and has uh, worked on uh, restoring cars um, with his dad. And he was just telling me that his favorite car that he's worked on was an original Fiat. Yeah, an original Fiat 500 that he restored with his dad. And what color did you paint it? Red. Bright red, of course. Okay, great. All right. Thanks, Derek. So before I get started this morning, I just wanted to go over a brief clarification. Some of you might have seen the newest issue of Moran Focus magazine that came out this month. Um, and as you might have seen, it has our typical list of current residents and fellows, uh, including our three female past fellows that we have this year. And you'll see this picture here. <laughs> and um, just wanted to clarify that I'm in fact not Shannon Stallings. I don't know if Shannon's here today. Uh, I don't see her, but um, I wanted to make sure Shannon got credit for who she really is. And um, I don't think this picture really does her justice. So, <laughs> All right, let's get started. So I'm going to present a case that I happened to be involved with while I was an intern on the inpatient neurology service. The uh, patient was originally seen here at the Moran, and then I was involved in his care uh, over at the University Hospital. So patient DS, 20-year-old uh, Caucasian right-handed male, <coughs> presented uh, to the Moran here with one month of black spot in his left eye is what he noticed. Uh, he described it as a sudden onset happened after work one day. He works as a, a loader at um, Walmart. Uh, he was seen by an outside optometrist. Uh, with a quote normal exam. S later sent to the triage clinic where he presented with these complaints. Um, denied any diplopia, flashes, floaters, headache, any pain. Um, also had some, uh, he was answering his questions very vaguely and kind of evasive in his question and in his answers, um, acting a little bit strangely. Um, and then multiple occasions he was requesting a note for his recent work absences. Uh, his past ocular history, he had a flash burn to his eyes in 2007, never had eye surgery. Uh, past medical history, um, he was admitted to the hospital after having a seizure. He had a drug overdose with GHB, which is commonly known on the street as the date rape drug. However, this was not the mechanism, mechanism of which he took the drug. Um, also had a concussion after a motor vehicle accident shortly before presentation, about five, six months. Uh, history of alcohol dependence, depression, family history significant for depression, and a mother with or a mother's cousin with muscular dystrophy. No other neurologic uh, diseases in the family, strokes, demyelinating things like that. Um, surgical history: he's never had surgery. Uh, social history is quite complicated. Um, he's a current smoker. He drinks to excess many days a week. Uh, multiple uh, street drugs here: meth, cocaine, ecstasy. We mentioned GHB. Uh, abuse of uh, prescription pain medication, also huffing compressed air cans. Um, however, he does deny history of IV drug use uh, ever, and he did report a four-month uh, abstinence from drugs prior to his presentation. Um, one other tidbit, he's living uh, in an aunt's house in town uh, with several cats. Do not use litter boxes. He says there's a lot of cat feces kind of lying around the house and things like that. Uh, sexual history, multiple female partners, no male partners. No history of STDs, doesn't take any medications, no allergies, and on review of systems, he had a nonspecific upper respiratory like infection uh, three weeks or so prior to presentation. So his initial exam, uh, he was in no acute distress. He was alert and oriented times four.
However, he was noted to be somewhat restless on the uh, on presentation, kind of moving around a lot and pretty fidgety. Uh, his visual acuity was 2070 and 2080 in the left eye. This he had been dilated at the optometrist's office, um, therefore we weren't able to um, check for apparent pupillary defects. Um, no improvement on pinhole in the left eye and a slight improvement on the right eye. Uh, his color vision was uh, mildly decreased in both eyes. Um, motility was full. He had a noted to have some fine end gaze nystagmus. Uh, unconfrontational visual fields. Uh, his fields were diminished in multiple quadrants from all sides, however, most markedly in the supratemporally, supratemporal quadrant in both eyes. Uh, slit lamp exam was actually unremarkable, however, he was noted to have some anterior vitreous cell in both eyes. Uh, was pretty mild, however, uh, flat coupless discs and no other retinal pathology. So we got a, a visual field here on the patient. As you can see that in both eyes, the fields are restricted, especially in the left eye, is kind of diffuse restriction, more so on the uh, left uh, side of his visual field. Um, the technician did note here that the patient wasn't moving around a, a ton during the exam, fidgety and moving his eyes side to side. Um, there is about 12 out of 15 fixation losses here on the on the right eye and some fixation losses also on the left eye. Therefore, the question, uh, reliability of this visual field is somewhat in question. However, you can see that there is somewhat of a drop off here uh, respecting the vertical meridian in both eyes. So early differential diagnosis for this patient. Was this patient malingering? He came in kind of vague complaints, asking for a work excuse, kind of nonspecific. He was acting strangely. Um, the fellow who saw him was actually thinking maybe he was intoxicated at the time, uh, given his social history. Uh, was this an infectious process? Did he have something going on in his brain, uh, either neoplastic or demyelinating issue? Was this trauma-related? Trauma with his drug use, he could have been involved in some type of altercation, and he was just being kind of elusive with his history. Uh, also other things, drug-induced visual disturbance, uh, toxic nutritional optic neuropathy. Um, so also because of those anterior vitreous cells that we're seeing, the initial workup for uveitis was undertaken with uh, tests for any type of immunocompromise, basic labs. Um, all these came back uh, normal, by the way. Yeah, 28, I think. Um, looks like 20 something now. Sorry. Back to what we did initially after the visual field, we started him on multivitamin just because of his uh, potentially malnutrition state and uh, prolonged alcohol use. Uh, asked him to come back to clinic the following week so we could review the visual field. On his return visit to the neuro-ophthalmology clinic, uh, his mother accompanied him this time, which was actually very, very useful in, in our history taking. Um, she noticed that the patient had become increasingly confused over the past several weeks he was no longer able to speak clearly as he usually was. He's usually very articulate, the mother said. Um, also, he wasn't really understanding common words that he would normally understand. She had to explain to him things like, what does fatigue mean, he would ask, and just common words that he would normally know. Um, his vision had slightly improved. Um, color vision also was slightly improved. He had no afferent pupillary defect. And then on retest of his confrontational visual field, it does um, correlate with the prior visual field of a left, left monomous uh, superior quadrant deficit and less so in the inferior visual field that was tested just grossly. Uh, visual, uh, movements were full, cranial nerves in intact, um, no cells noted on this exam on, the, uh, on repeat, and his uh, dilated exam, his discs were still flat and coupless. Uh, rest of the neurologic exam was also um, intact.
repeat visual field. We can see here that the this diploma that maybe we saw before is kind of less over the, the uh, vertical meridian here. And then the rest of this visual field is much more reliable, less just stationary. And you can see clearly that it respects this vertical meridian <coughs> consisting of the left homonymous Aminopia. Um, so what's the next step in the management of this patient? This might be pretty obvious, but we're not gonna send this patient home after these complaints of confusion, visual loss, and now with a much more reliable visual field. So, MRI, the next step. So here's a T2 axial scan of the patient's brain. You can see here there's multiple hyperintense lesions here, even in the cerebellum. And as we go upward, uh, multiple hyperintense lesions in the white matter of his brain. Mostly in the white matter, also it's kind of at the gray matter, white matter junction. Um, asymmetric pattern, diffuse, patchy. Um, also to note here is that his optic nerves um, look relatively normal. Flare sequence, you can see it's the same thing, basically hyper intense patchy white lesions in the white matter. And the T1 uh, images of the patient, a um, little bit different appearance here, some ring type lesions, um, which can broaden our differential, something to think about. So revised differential diagnosis. Number one on the differential is demyelinating issues such as acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Other things such as infectious, um, I mentioned the ring lesions which broaden the differential to all these different um, either uh, bacterial, uh, fungal uh, vasculitides, things like that. Uh, other things like multiple sclerosis, uh, subtypes of multiple sclerosis like velo concentric sclerosis. Um, vasculitis, lupus, neurosarcoidosis, and some other more rare things down here at the bottom of the list. Uh, back to the ring, ring enhancing lesions that we saw, the differential is quite long, uh, but just to keep in mind that there's many bacterial, fungal, parasitic, neoplastic, inflammatory uh, diseases that can cause lesions that look like this. And these are mostly, can be teased out on um, MRI to for different patterns of enhancement, which can help uh, aid therapy. So another list here based on the MRI findings. Um, our patient would be in this category multifocal discrete lesions, also some bilateral and diffuse large lesions of the white matter, which may help uh, dif uh, narrow our differential to some of these things, multiple sclerosis, things like that. So our workup um, included the patient was sent to the university um, for this MRI and then this is when I started becoming involved in this care log on the neurology service. A patient was, uh, had a lumbar puncture, his serum and CSF was sent for numerous different infectious um, pathogens, toxoplasmosis, multiple virus, HSV, ZZV, TMV. Um, the only things that came back um, positive on this, he did have a CSF IgM that was elevated um, for varicella zoster. However, repeat PCR of that fluid uh, showed a negative, uh, was negative for ZZV. Um, his blood cultures, fungal cultures, AFB cultures also came back negative. Um, his lumbar puncture of note was pretty unremarkable. I mean, he did have a few higher white blood cells than normal, 0% uh, neutrophils, but normal glucose, normal protein, so pretty unimpressive uh, CSF. Um, also of note in the CSF, he had seven oligoclonal bands, which is a marker for demyelinating diseases such as multiple sclerosis. Um, also had a chest x-ray, which was normal, and was initially treated with IV methylprednisolone, uh, 1,000 milligrams daily for three days. Um, and we'll see why we decided to treat him with that. So now we have a narrow differential diagnosis. The first thing was to rule out infectious causes because we don't want to treat anybody with high dose steroids if they have potential fungal infection or other types of infection. So we pretty much did that with all those tests that we did, although those did not come back very quickly. Um, because of his unimpressive lumbar puncture and his general state of being, normal white count, we thought we could 
pretty much say, based on the radiographic evidence, that this is not an infectious process. It looks more like this. And to be here, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or ABIN. So just a brief discussion about ADEM. It's an immune-mediated inflammatory demyelinating disorder of the central nervous system, commonly seen in young children, age range five to eight years old, but it has been reported in all ages. Um, commonly preceded by an infection, it used to be called post-infectious encephalomyelitis. Um, Nonspecific URI, typical history that patients can give, such as our patient. Um, lesions that are seen on MRI typically involve the white matter, fluid the hemispheres, brainstem, even optic nerves and spinal cord. Therefore, other diagnoses like clinically isolated syndromes like optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, uh, neuromyelitis optica um, can kind of muddy the water in terms of what's the true diagnosis here. Um, multifocal involvement and encephalopathy are uh, presenting signs. And then the disease is generally monophasic. Uh, however, patients have been shown to relapse and come back in within a few months period, and then that's considered the same episode of uh, this disease. Diagnostic criteria for diagnosing Adam. Um, this can be acute or subacute. Patients usually have a, a shorter duration of symptoms than those who present with um, symptoms of multiple sclerosis. MRI shows multiple hyperintense lesions, as we saw. Um, a key point of the history is the patients are encephalopathic. Um, one of the things that was not noticed on the first uh, presentation to the Moran was how confused this patient truly was. It was tough to get a, a true base baseline on the patient. Um, was he just acting his normal way? Was he intoxicated? But once the mother came in with him and really told us how he was acting so strangely, that was a key addition to the history. Um, no, ev no evidence of previous white matter lesions. This is kind of tough to say on most patients. We don't have baseline MRIs on patients, but that's included in the diagnostic criteria. However, this criteria is somewhat uh, up for debate. Epidemiology, quite rare. Under 20-year-old patients, the incidence is less than one in 100,000 per year. This is the incidence noted in California. I don't have data for the entire country. Mean age range, as I mentioned, five to eight years old, however reported in all uh, ages. Slight male predominance. And then in keeping with the uh, thought that this is a post-infectious uh, process, increase incidence in the winter and, sp uh, winter and spring and decrease in the summer months. So presentation, our patient was pretty typical. Symptoms occur for a couple days, up to four weeks post-infection. He presented about a month, so he might have been a little bit further out than was typically noted. 70 to 93 percent of patients report an antecedent infection. Uh, typical symptoms include fever, headache, vomiting, meningismus, encephalopathy, like this patient had. Uh, up to a third of patients can have seizures, and if there's any involvement of the brainstem, patients can actually have respiratory compromise and require uh, ventilation. Uh, rash is also another uh, nonspecific finding seen in these patients in keeping with a viral illness. Other symptoms, other neurologic signs, uh, hemiplegia is quite common, ataxia, cranial neuropathies, which can include the uh, third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerves can cause diplopia. Visual loss due to optic neuritis, um, seen less commonly. Spinal cord dysfunction, uh, impaired speech like this patient had. And patients don't necessarily have to present like a typical infection. It's leukocytosis, elevated ESR, CRP. These are patients that are, for the most part, out of this uh, infectious window. However, it's good to have baseline labs to make sure that they don't have a, something else going on underlying the central nervous system infection. Some of the implicated pathogens, the list is very, very long, as you can see here. Um, some of the more common things like coronavirus, which has common cold, influenza, measles, and little children that haven't been vaccinated, um, multiple bacterial infections. And then the more rare things that you might see in the developing world, malaria, dengue fever. Um, also, interestingly, is some vaccines have been implicated in the uh, development of this disease. Less than 5% of cases, however, most commonly the MMR, MMR vaccine uh, has been linked to this. Um, other things that maybe you and I might have had recently is the 2009 H1N1 influenza vaccination has been linked to this as well. So 
quick pathology. You can see here that this um, disease involves perivascular inflammation, edema, perivenular demyelination. You can see here there's uh, lymphocytes and macrophages surrounding this venule here, and there's relative sparing of the uh, arterial down here. These are some special stains for myelin, and there is a clear border here of demyelination around this venule, and the same thing seen here. Proposed mechanism of this disease, although it's not known for sure, similar to multiple sclerosis, is a transient autoimmune response to myelin or other self antigens because of the activation of autoreactive T-cell clones. Molecular memory is mimicry is one of the uh, most um, common hypotheses that's uh, written in the literature. Basically, host pathogens or pathogens and host cells have enough similarity to incite T-cell activation and response, however, not enough um, similarity to induce uh, T-cell tolerance. That's how this mechanism works, basically. Uh, another mechanism proposed, there's a direct infection of the central nervous system, which damages the blood-brain barrier, and there's leakage of these uh, autoantigens into the uh, into the serum, and then an autoimmune reaction, which occurs after that. Uh, high affinity antibodies to myel myelin basic protein, which would lead to destruction of myelin and give you these characteristic findings on MRI. And then most recently, there's this uh, protein called myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, um, there's assays for the IgG levels of this, and there's higher levels of this I of MOG, IgG in the um, serum of patients uh, with Adam and also clinically isolated syndromes. So workup, as we did in the emergency room, a lumbar puncture, patient already had an MRI. This would go MRI first, then lumbar puncture. Uh, labs to rule out any infectious etiologies like we did. And then demyelinating markers. These are somewhat um, mixed in terms of how helpful these are. We typically see patients that are admitted with multiple sclerosis flares, they get oligoclonal band levels like this patient did, an IgG index. These are markers for uh, demyelination. Uh, however, the studies that I've looked up did not show any sig statistical significant difference uh, between patients with MS and patients with ADEM in terms of, uh, is this useful for, for characterizing one over the other. Lumbar puncture, like in our patient, patient may have a little bit of pleocytosis, increased protein concentration, but for the most part, these patients can have normal CSF, unremarkable. This kind of helps you say, oh, this might not be infectious, and these lesions look characteristic of demyelination. I'm more comfortable starting steroids without completing my infectious workup. Neuroimaging, so this is really a diagnosis clinically and radiographically. T2 and flare are the best imaging uh, sequences to, to show these demyelinating lesions, as I showed previously. Subcortical white matter, gray white junction lesions, multifocal, asymmetric, patchy white hyperintense lesions. Uh, throughout the CNS, we can see them not only in the cortex or subcortical areas or the uh, cerebellum like our patient had, also in the thalamus, basal ganglia, which can lead to patients' um, ataxia and things like that. Uh, periventricular sparing, this is a variable sign on MRI. Um, MRI on multiple sclerosis is more typically shows these periventricular uh, hyperintensities. Um, there isn't any statistical significant difference in between uh, periventricular sparing and MS and ADEM, however. Uh, also, optic neuritis has been reported and CT is often normal and not helpful, so always go with MRI in these similar cases. Okay, here's some more typical uh, images of patients with ADEM. Uh, you can see here, maybe more so than in our patient, this confluent patchy white hyperintense lesions in the white matter. Um, over here on the right, you can see lesions involving the thalamus. Here's an MRI of a patient, 18-month-old uh, patient with similar lesions to also involve the center of the brain here. Some of the ophthalmic manifestations that we want to look out for as clinicians that we might have patients like this walking in, just like as we did here. Visual field deficit, deficits like our patient had. Optic neuritis is a presentation, cranial neuropathies causing double vision, ptosis. This is a case report of a patient taken from the University of Iowa. 
who presented um, with white matter lesions on his MRI as well as uh, grade two papilledema. Here's the MRI of that same patient. You see enhancement of the right optic nerve here. Uh, I don't have any of the other cuts lower down, but he did have um, characteristic lesions for this disease. Another patient that presented with uh, optic nerve swelling as well as peripapular hemorrhages. This is another rare presentation of this disease, however, something to keep in mind if uh, this is seen on, on your fundoscopic exam. Now, a little distinction <coughs> from multiple sclerosis. Many of you might be saying, well, what's, what's the difference between multiple sclerosis and this, and how, how am I going to differentiate this based on MRI? And of course, the neuroradiologists are the ones to really say, oh, this is more characteristic of ADUM versus multiple sclerosis. However, just briefly, um, some studies, one by Schwartz, showed that um, patients had a significantly longer duration of symptoms in MS than the patients that present with ADEM. Um, less likely to have prior infection in MS as well. Another study by Callan and his colleagues, uh, radiographic criteria that they proposed, absence of diffuse bilateral lesions, um, presence of black holes on MRI, presence of two or more periventricular lesions. These are more suggestive of multiple sclerosis and a pretty high uh, sensitivity and specificity for differentiating these two entities. Another picture here. This is uh, MRI that's typical of MS. So you can see some differences here. There's multiple ovoid um, lesions here periventricularly. You can see here on the T2 and the flare images. Then the uh, sagittal section here, you can see periventricular around the corpus callosum. These are, I guess you could call these Dawson's fingers as they commonly call them in the uh, radiology speak. And um, down here, um, these are showing some black holes. They're pretty hard to, sh to see here. They're small, but uh, these are characteristic findings of multiple sclerosis. So there is some overlap with MS. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm looking at your. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a, I think a T, T1 post contrast, that, that image that shows this. Overlap with multiple sclerosis, the same study with Schwartz. Um, they did a pretty long-term follow-up of 38 months of these patients. Uh, these were adult patients now, and 35% of the patients that initially diagnosed with ADEM did progress to MS, and all of these were within one year. So it's a pretty high and scary number if you think about it. Um, the data in children is a little bit less. Um, you can see that the uh, development of MS is, is around 28% maximum. There's a range depending on what study you look at. The use of oligoclonal bands I mentioned before. Is there an increased likelihood of relapse in ADM or development of MS of patients that have elevated oligoclonal bands? Potentially, there's conflicting data. One study showed no statistical significant, uh, significant difference um, between patients that had ADEM and MS, and so it's not really a useful tool in differentiating. Um, another table here just showing some increased risk versus decreased risk of patients that could develop MS. If you're greater than 10 years old, 10 years old and develop this disease, you're at greater risk. Patients without encephalopathy, no precipitating infection, those with optic neuritis. Um, they, s they mentioned in oligoclonal bands based on their data, but I just kind of repeated that on my last slide. Uh, periventricular uh, perpendicular ovoid lesions, the Dawson's fingers that I showed you, are patients that are increased risk of developing MS. The treatment. So before diagnosis is certain, you want to make sure to cover for infectious uh, entities. Bacterial and viral uh, pathogens to be covered, things like acyclovir, and then antibiotics that are commonly used for uh, bacterial meningitis. Uh, first line treatment, however, for these demyelinating lesions is high-dose IV methylprednisolone. Our patient got the max dose of three days. 
Um, after his three-day course, he seemed to improve significantly. He was less confused. He said his vision was actually better, although we don't have any visual field to confirm that. Um, after these three to five days, uh, many authors propose using an oral prednisone taper over several weeks. There's no randomized control trials to support the use of uh, long-dose steroid taper. However, they ha some studies have noticed that shorter steroid tapers showed higher incidence of uh, relapse to this disease. Uh, other things to keep in mind uh, on an inpatient basis, anti-epileptic drugs for those that are experiencing seizures and up to a third of patients, respiratory support for those needing it if they have brainstem involvement, um, even things like continuous pulse oximetry are, can be useful in patients that are at risk. Um, second line treatment, um, if IV steroids are not cutting it, um, you can also use IVIG as an adjuvant or by itself. Uh, third line, there has been some anecdotal evidence that plasmapheresis has helped some of these patients. They typically do six exchanges every other day and shown some, some promise with this treatment. Um, also some case reports of patients that fail IV steroids using cyclophosphamide interferon be beta, uh, but no hard data to support uh, use of this. Clinical course of this patient, uh, actually for typical patients, is slow recovery over three to 12 weeks, could be longer. Uh, many patients have complete resolution of their MRI findings up to 75%. Uh, and I'd say a combination between the patients that have complete resolution and partial resolution is the majority. Uh, rec current recommendations are for two follow-up MRI studies after a first normal MRI. So if this patient would have come back six months after had a normal MRI, then we would have gotten two subsequent MRIs to make sure that he does not have any more active lesions. And just keep a close eye on him. He's in the adult range. He is at significant risk for developing multiple sclerosis. Uh, some early data on mortality rates of this disease is less than 5%. And I think things have clearly gotten better now that we have more advanced diagnostic techniques, better imaging techniques, and uh, just better in-hospital care. 38-month um, follow-up in that Schwartz study that I mentioned, 46% uh, of patients were symptom-free, 35%, so up to a third of patients were mi had minor residual symptoms, whether that be uh, mild um, hemiplegia, um, ataxia, speech deficit, visual field problems. And then 12% of patients in the study actually had moderate deficits. None of them were incapacitated to the point where they needed long-term care. Um, our patient follow-up, um, he's actually originally from Las Vegas, so he, he was kind of bouncing back between Salt Lake and, and Las Vegas. However, we did see him three weeks post-op in the neurology clinic uh, with the follow-up MRI. Um, patient's mother was with him this time. She thought his, his speech was much better. We did note that he did have some mild speech uh, errors uh, during the exam, uh, but nothing uh, major. They recommended he go to speech therapy for these. Um, MRI, I'll show you a picture on the next slide, did show interval decrease of the size of lesions, less intense, so we do think that this is very, very consistent with ADEM. Um, unfortunately, we do not have a follow-up visual field or visual acuity on this patient. Um, we also recommended a six-month follow-up MRI, which none of these are in PowerCut, so this patient was lost to follow-up, unfortunately. So here's a comparison of his MRI. This is a T-tube image here. Uh, this is on presentation. I showed you this before very, very large uh, lesion here, which is most likely accounting for his visual field deficit. Um, and then here, three weeks later, decreased intensity on these white matter lesions here. And then also this lesion here at the front. So conclusions and observations that are important for ophthalmologists. Important to know this is in post-infectious uh, etiology, demyelinating lesions. It's acute in onset, can affect your younger patients not just in the elderly. Um, visual symptoms um, can be common, like optic things that present as optic neuritis, visual field deficits, cranial neuropathies. This is a steroid responsive disease, and there is a uh, connection with multiple sclerosis, so patients do need long-term follow-up for these. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you.